Hello, and welcome to Ed Talks with Khan Academy. I'm Kristen DeServo, the Chief Learning Officer at Khan Academy, and I am excited today to talk to Dr. Matt Townsley, who is a professor and author of Making Grades Matter. We'll be talking about all things grading, so if you have questions, please drop them into the chat. I want to remind you before we start that Khan Academy is a nonprofit organization. We're able to do our work thanks to donations from folks like you. If you go to khanacademy.org slash donate, you'll find a place where you can make that donation and help us keep doing that work. So thank you so much for if you're able to give. I also want to recognize our corporate uh, folks who have helped support us in the times of COVID, including AT&T, General Motors, and Fastly. Next, if you want to listen to this broadcast again or find previous broadcasts and have ways to uh, listen to those when you're at the gym on your walk or otherwise listening to audio you can find them at homeroom with sal the podcast we look forward to uh, seeing you there so as i said i'm excited today to welcome matt townsley he is the author of making grades matter standards-based grading in a secondary PLC. So I am looking forward to talking about all things grading. Welcome. Well, hello. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. So I always like to first ask people, how did you end up studying grading and grades? What was your path to get here? Yeah, that's that's a really fun question and one I'm really excited and passionate about. Um, I don't think I went into education. I don't think anyone really went into education to get better at grading. In fact, it might just be something that we all have to do. Uh, although in 2008, I was a high school math teacher here in Iowa. I went to the state math teacher conference and there was a breakout session. It was called how to fix your broken grade book led by another high school math teacher. And I thought, well, I'll just go and see if I can take something away back to my own classroom and get a little bit better. Kristen, literally that 45 to 50 minute session changed my professional career forever. Uh, I came back really excited, talked to our high school principal at the time and uh, just you know thanked him for allowing me to go back in, uh, in 2008. And uh, he just really encouraged me to say, hey, could you try out something that you learned from this session in your classroom? And I thought, well, there's only nine weeks left in the school year. That seems kind of crazy, but I picked my last period geometry class and just started changing some things up related to grading. And as a result of that, I started reading every book or article or blog post I could find about grading. Uh, fast forward a couple years later, I had a number of conversations with other teachers in our, in our high school and our middle school, and they started thinking differently about grading. Fast forward another year or so later, and I got to promoted to the district office. And we had this dilemma in our school in, in, in Solon, Iowa, this, this little rural community in Iowa, where some of our teachers were thinking differently about grading and others weren't yet. And so we had a decision to make. Were we going to kind of be okay with that middle ground or were we, were we going to go on a journey to see if we all wanted to think about grading differently? And so obviously we made that decision to all think about grading differently. And so my experience comes from being a classroom teacher doing this standards-based grading thing and also uh, leading a change in our school district to make grading practices significantly different. Uh, you mentioned our books, uh, Making Grades Matter. And again, as a high school math teacher, I don't really consider myself to be a, an author or really that great of a writer, but uh, through others that have written books and heard about our work, uh, we're actually encouraged to write our own book. And so in standards-based uh, standards grading, it's not always viewed as something that is easily uh, attainable at the secondary level in particular. Um, and so our book really helps uh, middle school and high school teachers um, uh, take their next steps with standards-based grading. And so that's a little bit about my journey. Currently, though, I work at the University of Northern Iowa, where I teach future principals and superintendents, and also uh, support as many educators as possible uh, to take their next steps towards more effective grading practices. And it's just a, a thrill to be here today, talking about a topic I'm really, really, really passionate about. That is great. So let's start at the beginning. What is standards-based grading? Yeah, great. Maybe the best way to, to explain it is um, it's, it's, a, it's a philosophy or a process uh, or, or a set of practices that really aim to communicate students' current levels of learning separately uh, from their behaviors. Uh, when you think about maybe the grading practices that you and I experienced as a student, maybe we got like a 95% a in a class, but that 95% could have mean we got 95% of the points, or it could have meant we actually got 100% of the points and turned in a couple assignments late. And so 
Uh, maybe in the past, we've mixed kind of behaviors with, with learning. In standards-based grading, those two things are, are separate. And I think about when I take my car uh, to a mechanic. Sometimes I do a 20-point inspection. And on that 20-point inspection, it tells me if my brakes are really good or not very good, if my battery is really good or not very good. And so the mechanic kind of breaks down the components of my vehicle and gives me very specific feedback on how well my car is doing in each one of those. And so that's the aim of standards-based grading is really just to give our students a much more detailed perspective on a standard-by-standard -standard basis, if you will, on what they're doing really well at and what they could get even better at. And also uh, embeds elements of probably something I know you're very passionate about, uh, mastery learning as well. And I hope we can talk more about that today. That's great. So from a student perspective, what are the benefits of grading this way as opposed to a more traditional way? Yeah, so, so maybe in the past students have found themselves not really knowing what the currency of the classroom is. Sometimes it's just all about earning. Uh, when they're at that cusp of a uh, 89.4% and they want to get their grade up to an 89.5%, so they'll get rounded up to the favorable grade they want to get the scholarship or the honor roll or the GPA that they want. They may just ask the teacher, what can I do to improve my grade? And maybe the teacher is in a good mood that day and says, here's an extra credit crossword puzzle, or here's something else you can do. But maybe the teacher is not in that great of a mood or just maybe has more of a, hey, you need to, you know, just do better next time mindset. Um, because the currency of the classroom is all about earning at that, at that point. When the currency of the classroom, which is what standards-based grading is all about, is more about learning, now a student might ask, hey, Mr. Townsley, I'm not very good yet at Pythagorean's theorem. Could I show you how I'm better at Pythagorean's theorem now? And by showing me as the teacher that they're actually better at Pythagorean's theorem, then as a result of that, their grade might improve, which is a good thing, right? Because if a student has learned more of the math stuff or the science stuff or the social studies stuff, they should of course have a better grade because the purpose of grades is really to communicate students' current levels of learning. So students really, I believe, are more, uh, they have more ownership in, their, in the learning process because it's, it's, it's more about what's, what they're in control of, which is, the extent to which they've learned the standards in the class. Got it. So I see that link. So as we think about mastery learning here, one of the things that we're thinking about is that you're doing whatever the work you need is to increase your proficiency or work towards mastery. And it's not that you get one shot at a test and that's your score, but you can keep learning and keep trying and improving on that over time. Does that fit in then to this idea of grading based yeah. on standards yes indeed it does and, and in my own research i've uh read quite a bit about mastery learning so i can confirm this on a on a on that level Kristen. uh as i think back to mastery learning uh, i think of benjamin bloom and others that have really set the foundation for what mastery learning is and you know back in the day there was this mentality of well only a certain percent of the students ought to deserve an a or only a certain element of students ought to be successful in a class kind of that bell-shaped curve IQ testing mentality. Um, but when Bloom and others really challenged that mindset, they said, you know what? Uh, if we provide students more time and the right conditions, many, 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 many more students can learn at a high level. In other words, if, if achievement can be constant and time can become the variable, then even more students can learn at a high level. And uh, as I think about standards-based grading, uh, that's really what it aims to do. As I think about the grading practices again that maybe you and I experienced back in the day, Kristen, if we did not do very well kind of early on in the learning process, maybe we you know, turned in some homework assignments that we didn't really understand what was going on in our class, we kind of dug ourselves into a hole point-wise or percentage-wise. Within a standards-based grading mindset, it's really all about how much has a student learned. And if, it's, and if Kristen, if you or I and I are in the same class and you maybe learn it before I do, one of the premises of, of standards-based grading is it doesn't really matter when a student learns it. We honor the fact that students learn at different rates and different paces. And if my learning comes later, I'm going to erase that old version of learning in the gradebook. I'm going to replace it with more uh, recent evidence of learning. And again, that's a maybe a mindset shift in particular for, uh, for many of our secondary educators out there. But it really comes, it's not necessarily a new idea. It comes from years and years and years of theory and research related to mastery learning. 
Uh, I think Leanne, Leanne Young and Tom Gusky in their 2011 article in the Clearinghouse really made some strong connections between mastery learning and also uh, the response to intervention model that many schools are working towards right now. That just says, hey, you know what? If we can really provide quality instruction, if we can also then provide the right amount of interventions to students who still do not yet understand it, we can help a lot of students learn at a high level. And, and, and all of those things really fit in the standards-based grading and, and mastery learning bucket, if you will. That totally makes sense. And it, this also is reminding me of links to motivation research, where there's whether students are motivated about, uh, to learn or whether they're motivated to get a score that shows what they learn. And that students who are motivated based on learning a new thing tend to be more engaged and more interested in learning. Is that connected to all of this as well in terms of, of increasing course. student of motivation? Of course, yes. Again, as I think about the default feedback that, that I included, that I gave to students back in the day before I went to this state math teacher conference, I would frequently give students like a, a 14 out of 16 on, on a quiz. But that 14 out of 16 really didn't tell the student what they're doing really well at and what they need to get better at. I mean, imagine if I went to the doctor's office, and the doctor's office said, you're, you know, you're about an 85% health. I'd be like, well, what's the other 15%, doc? Like, tell me, tell me, tell me. And so at the heart of standards-based grading is using uh, some other type of scale. You know, many uh, schools we use like uh, an almost uh, or, a, or a proficient or some other descriptor of learning uh, to, to tell a student exactly the extent to which they have learned that particular standard. And it, really what it is, it's, it's, it's much more specific feedback to the student on exactly what they're doing and what they need to do to get better. Uh, one of the things that I look back on my own teaching career and wonder is how often was I giving feedback to students that really helped them understand how to close the gap? Uh, and, and so sometimes when, when educators start doing this standards-based grading thing, they realize that it's not just the grade book that needs to improve, but it's also their feedback practices. And, um, you know, if I can just give a shout out to so many wonderful researchers and authors out there, uh, Susan Brookhart, Dylan William, and others that have really talked about uh, feedback being at the heart of the learning process. And uh, our students really deserve feedback, not on a unit three test or in just an essay perspective, but on a much more granular level, on a standard by standard level. And we provide them that very detailed level of feedback. You're right, Kristen, the research suggests they're much more excited and motivated uh, to improve upon that feedback. That makes sense. So you said this could be a change in, in thinking and mindset for some educators and where things are. What are some things that, for instance, when you came back from this, this conference, or what are maybe some initial steps that teachers could take towards this, uh, this different mindset? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, one is, in, in my mind, I tend to think about, you know, uh, uh, textbooks and chapters as being the driving force for what I taught. In fact, I'll never forget when uh, I got my first teaching job, I was assigned to teach uh, geometry in several other courses. And I asked some of their teachers and said, hey, like, what are kids supposed to learn geometry? And they said, well, here's the textbook. Most years we get to chapter 12 and some years we get to chapter 13. Like, here you go. Um, and so, of course, that's what I did. Um, but now what I know is, you know, most states have uh, some list of state standards, right? Like there have been some, uh, some, some people that have gotten together and said, these are the most important things that students are supposed to learn in biology or algebra one or, or seventh grade science. And so instead of thinking about the textbook being the driving force in what we teach, we should look at the standards. Uh, I worked with some PE teachers even in, in our school district, and they said, well, I was just so used to always doing, you know, the volleyball unit or the PE uh, or, or the football unit. And, and, to, and, and, and frankly, like that's the way they've always done it. And so that, that's OK. But we started thinking about what are the specific learning goals? What are the specific standards that students are supposed to be learning in PE or seventh grade science or math? And so Instead of thinking about the activities and the units as being the driver, we have to first start thinking about the standards or the learning goals being the driver. And then secondly, we have to design assessments that are very well aligned to those learning goals or those standards. Again, uh, so many of us, we just inherited uh, the assessments, right? The, um, the tests that come with the, with the textbook materials or, or the, the, the tests or the quizzes or the projects that have been handed down from one teacher to the next. 
um, we have to ask ourselves to what extent are those actually aligned to the learning goals that we want. And then finally, um, if, if I'm thinking about just a typical high school or middle school teacher, so many of us are used to grading based upon points and percentages. And points and percentages don't really do the best job of communicating to students what they're really good at and what they're not really good at. I mean, think about this. What's the difference between a student who has 96% on a test and 94% on a test? Is there, is there some like really, is there a difference that's actually describable? Can, can we put our mind and our hands and our, and, our, and our fingers on what that difference is in, the, in, that, in that 2%? So when educators really wrap their mind around the standards-based grading thing, they're going to, instead of thinking about percentages, they're going to think about some levels of learning. Uh, like beginning, developing, area of concern, and proficient. Um, uh, and again, that's just a huge mind shift for, for so many of us, not because we may not want to do it, but because in our teacher preparation programs, we haven't necessarily been taught how to do it yet. And, and I'm confident as we continue to uh, improve and evolve in, uh, in our teacher preparation and administrative preparation programs that in time we'll get to that point where more educators will be familiar with this process. Yeah, so that leads me to think, how much can, uh, can a teacher do this on their own versus how much do they need the school support, changing what the report cards look like, changing what you know, the, the parents are expecting to come home and where those are. What's the, the balance between those? Oh, Kristen, you're giving me some good flashbacks to uh, 2008, 2009 as, <laughs> as uh, myself and just a few other teachers as we started doing it. Frankly, Kristen, it was a it was an uphill battle for, for a number of years because in our classrooms, we were trying to reculture, um, as I referred to earlier, as, as the currency of our classroom for students being all about learning. Uh, and, and again, this is not because our, the, the other teachers in our school were consciously doing it, but that's just because that, that's just what they knew. And so students in my class might have, I might have been the only teacher that they had all day long where the currency of the classroom was learning early on. And so it, it takes a really passionate, knowledgeable teacher to say, you know what, there's going to be some, some hiccups. There are going to be some implementation dips along the way. And one very specific one, as we think about, again, this idea of mastery learning is that time becomes the variable, not the constant. We want achievement to be the constant. So myself as a teacher, I have to figure out times during my class period or times during the school day where I can provide additional instruction to students who have not yet demonstrated understanding of Pythagorean's theorem or the other standards in, in the classroom. And that's much easier when the whole school is on board. You know, we'll hear about schools doing an intervention time or a, a what I need time, or if their mascot is tiger, a tiger time where school-wide students are provided time uh, for additional instruction and, and reassessments. If those specific times during the day are not in place, and if the culture of most classrooms is still more about earning than is about learning, for individual teachers, this is going to be a, uh, a pretty big uphill battle. And so that's why in our book, Making Grades Matter, we talk about the, the individual classroom shifts in, in many of our chapters. And we talk about doing it as a, as a team, as a professional learning community together. And then the final chapter of our book, we also talk about uh, specifically how to make this entire shift as a school. And so in the research that I've done and, and that I've seen, Kristen, uh, almost always there is a, a certain level of, of an implementation dip that happens. And it's most often because uh, we're not approaching it as an entire school and, and understanding that there will be an implementation dip. And so I appreciate that question. So I want to encourage uh, listeners and viewers out there that are really thinking about making the shifts to, to know and appreciate the implementation dip and, and, and to write it out and, and to encourage uh, our entire school uh, to make these changes in, in time. And it really does take time. That totally makes sense. So we have a couple of questions that are similar uh, to each other and along the same line. So one from Aviv and one from Lance McConnell. So what are the, the things to, to start to work with teachers to help shift mindsets? And Aviv asked, if teachers have less flexibility, what are some things that they can do? Again, a first couple of steps to start changing their practice. Yeah, uh, I'd say a couple things. Uh, one is uh, just to first take a, kind of a, a balcony view and say, what's the purpose of grades in my classroom? 
you know, sometimes we'll, we'll kind of jump right down to the actionable things that a, that a teacher should do. And like maybe instead of uh, giving zeros for incomplete work, maybe just give 50s. You know, sometimes we'll hear about schools doing that. And while that's an admirable practice, uh, in absence of really focusing on what's the purpose of grades. Oh, the purpose of grades is to communicate learning. So just having the conversation with a department, having a conversation with an individual teacher, having a conversation at a faculty meeting, like what do we believe as a school or as a team is the purpose of grading? And then if it, while we're waiting for maybe everyone to move forward in an actionable way and some of the things I mentioned earlier, um, individual teachers can start doing what I call having one fit, one foot in the standards-based grading world and one foot in the traditional grading world. And we can experiment with our students. For example, at an upcoming uh, test, um, if, if you know as a teacher that you cannot yet put like a, a one, two, three, or four, or a um, area of concern beginning uh, almost there proficient in the gradebook yet, you could still provide that same level of feedback to students on an upcoming test for each standard or learning goal. And just ask students, hey, if with this level of feedback, what do you want to do next? How can I help you as a teacher improve on these learning goals? What can you do as a student to improve on these learning goals? And you can have the conversation without having to change anything at all in the grade book. Now, in that scenario, you would still put whatever the, the building or the district requires, like a percentage in the grade book, but you would have the conversation with your students to see how they would react to a much more specific uh, learning goal feedback. And I think what most educators will find is that students actually crave that same level of feedback. One of the things I did in my own classroom is I started asking students about the level of feedback they got from their, uh, their drama director or their musical director or their band instructor or their football coach. And most often, all of those extracurricular or co-curricular sponsors and coaches gave them very detailed feedback. And so I think if we make that connection, even if we can't be all in in the grade book because of building or district policy constraints, we can still begin to provide that same level of feedback to our students and see how they react to it. And, and what that's going to require is just taking a more precise look at our assessments and aligning them to standards. And I think any teacher can start doing that you know, now uh, without having to have the permission of their uh, administration or have some switch turned on at the electronic grade book level to make that possible. Great. Here's another question uh, from Facebook, Greg Mullen. Uh, it's a little bit different, but interesting. How, how does standards-based grading help prepare students for higher education? And I wonder if there's a sub-question in there of like, if I give grades like this, are colleges going to look at it kind of funny? <laughs> yeah, fun, fun to hear uh, some of these uh, names being thrown out there, Kristen. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Greg, for your questions. Uh, so regarding your question here, Greg, um, just a fantastic question, one that is very important to discuss specifically for high schools making this shift. Uh, first, so often uh, secondary parents or secondary uh, teachers or secondary administrators will say, if we do this, is it really going to prepare students for college? Uh, first, uh, a couple things. First, if uh, most of the high schools I know that do this, they still eventually determine a specific letter grade from the standard marks in the grade book. And so these high schools still have a GPA that's still used for admissions and scholarship decisions. Now down the weeds a little bit, then the next uh, question maybe Greg's thinking about is, but what if we provide students these multiple opportunities? What if, what if we provide these redos and retakes in the spirit of mastery learning? They may or may not do that at the college level. Well, uh, what we have to know at the, at the K-12 level is our aim, because of federal legislation such as No Child Left Behind and Every Student Succeeds Act, our aim is to help as many kids as possible get it. Like that's our job in the K-12 world. That may or may not be what the university and college folks um, are, are doing. And again, as a college professor, I can kind of speak to that. Um, that there's just a different paradigm sometimes at the college or university level. So regardless of what college or universities do, um, our aim in K-12 is to help as many kids as possible get it. And so we believe that kids learn at different rates and different paces. So we're, of course, that then it makes sense to provide students multiple opportunities to demonstrate their learning through this whole reteaching and reassessment process. And finally, uh, some research that I've done with Dr. Thomas Gusky and Dom, Dr. Thomas Buckmiller uh, suggests that college students, 
uh, at the end of their first semester freshman year, we actually went through some surveys and interviews of students who self-disclosed that they went to a high school that was doing this standards-based grading stuff. Uh, they shared with us in our research that was published towards the end of 2020 in uh, the NASSP Bulletin Journal that they had just uh, an okay time adjusting to the college and university level. And so if we have this idea in our mind that somehow going to wreck them as they transition to the college university, um, our research suggests that's just not the case um, uh, as well. So thank you, Greg uh, and others for that wonderful, wonderful question. Excellent. Lots of good questions coming in. Um, here's a, another one thinking about um, how does this apply to gifted students? Mm, fantastic. And I great, wonder great, if there's great. thoughts about, yeah, does this create a ceiling that, you know, that prevents gifted students from maybe moving yeah. into accelerated work or something? I think there's two facets that are actually beneficial uh, to, uh, to gifted education. Uh, one of them is this. I mean, I think about some students I had in my own classroom uh, that were they were just high achievers, and uh, and I worked in a in a high achieving school district, one of the most high achieving school districts in the state of Iowa, and there were some students who they were still required, you know, this was pre standards based grading, they were still required to do the homework or the practice because it, there was a point value attached to it, but they they knew their parents knew I knew that they really didn't need to do that practice. And so it was just busy work for the sake of getting points to get the grade that they wanted. In a standards-based grading uh, philosophy or school, um, there is no point value attached to, whole, to assignments that are intended to be more practice-oriented. So if I'm a gifted student, now I no longer am subjected to doing busy work for the sake of busy work to get points. I think that's a huge win for our gifted students who may have other aspirations. Uh, secondly, in, in, in some schools, what they will do is they'll say, wow, this student, based upon this assessment evidence I have right now, is already proficient. They're already rocking and rolling with a specific standard. And so I'm going to provide some level of extension activity uh, for the student. Before, we would not have had that same detailed level of information for the learner because prior to standards-based grading, we would not have known by the student, by the standard who was already getting it. Uh, but with a standards-based grading mentality and gradebook, now we'll know specifically, not just who the gifted students are, but the specific standards that they're absolutely rocking and rolling with. So, uh, Kristen, I think to summarize, this, this standards-based grading thing can be very beneficial to, to gifted uh, students or, or the high-achieving students because it provides better information to them uh, and to their teachers about where it is exactly they're rocking and rolling. And it frankly just eliminates some busy work that they may have been subjected to uh, in the past. Great. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sneak in one more question here <laughs> before we, we close out. So the other place that I've been hearing a lot about standards-based grading is in conversations around equity and yes. in schools that are serving students from historically under-resourced communities. Tell me how you see standards-based grading potentially helping those students. Yeah, there's plenty of research that has been done about uh, the factors that teachers consider in, uh, in determining a grade. And this is, again, pre-standards-based grading. And what we'll find in that research is that often teachers consider things like participation, sometimes even attendance. And what we know when we look at students of, of different backgrounds is that uh, by grading based upon participation and attendance, that is a very inequitable practice uh, for some student groups. Um, I also think about, you know, just to, to focus in on a very specific practice that um, I'm ashamed to say that I did in my own classroom. That's awarding extra credit points for students bringing in materials such as Kleenex boxes or whiteboard markers. Think about the families that are able to do that and the families that are not able to do that. It's pretty obvious um, that uh, there are families who are able to to buy their kids' grades or improve their kids' grades by bringing in these materials. And I think, of course, this is just a, a far out over-exaggerated example, but this happens to the point where there was a, a legislator in Iowa several years ago that proposed a law to eliminate this practice because of the very question that you brought up, Kristen. And so perhaps the viewers and listeners here that are thinking about maybe just a real small step they consider, if we are to eliminate the awarding of extra credit for materials, that's one step closer to more equitable grading practices. 
And if we want to eliminate providing some points in our classrooms for participation or, or for attendance, um, that would be another great and wonderful step we could do um, that is more equitable for students uh, of different backgrounds and demographics. So, yeah, and I just give a shout out to Joe Feldman, who wrote a fantastic book called Grading for Equity that speaks even more detail to this very topic. And so we're hearing some pretty big school districts across the state saying we want to make some of these grading changes because equity is our driving force behind it. And I, I'm, I'm saddened to see that the COVID-19 happened. But in a way, I'm pretty excited to know that as a result of COVID-19 happening, that more schools are recognizing how to create and utilize more equitable grading practices. So thank you for bringing that topic to light, Kristen. Absolutely. Well, this 30 minutes has flown by. It's been so nice talking to you. Thank you for all the, the research you're doing and the work you're doing to help schools and teachers make this shift. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much, Kristen, for having me. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. Great. And thanks for everyone out there who's been uh, listening. We will see you next time.